اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم <تصفح> الحمد لله رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلين شفیع ذنوبنا وطبیب نفوسنا وحبیب قلوبنا ابی القاسم محمد وآلہ الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المظلومین واصحاب المنتجبین ومن تبعهم بإحسان الى قیام یوم الدین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری ویسر لی امری وحل لقدتا من لسانی یفقه قولی اما بعد السلام علیکم جمیعا ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ اعظم اللہ جرنا و جرکم بمصابنا بی ابی عبداللہ الحسین علیہ السلام تو ہم نے کہا کہ تی پر سورہ جو بگن تو بی ریویلڈ اپن دی بلیسد پروفیٹ ور امیڈیٹلی لکنگ ایٹ ہیز اون سائیکولوجی وٹ ہی واز تھنکنگ اینڈ دا سچویشن دیٹ ہی واز فیسنگ ود ان مکہ اینڈ دی تھنگز دیٹ کنسرنڈ ہم تو دی سورہز ور ٹوکنگ اباؤٹ تھینک یو تو دی سورہز ور ٹوکنگ اباؤٹ دی ایگزسٹنس آف گاڈ the prevalence of God within human life, they were addressing the Jahiliya attitude. They were addressing the arrogance of the Jahiliya and their disconnect with God, their disconnect with care for the poor and society. Their state of ego and arrogance that we are the ones who are in control of our affairs and we are the ones who actually make things happen for ourselves. So these were the very first surahs that are coming upon the blessed prophet showing him that look no there is a god he is loftier he is in control as opposed to this state you just wait and see what we do to them in one of the early surahs the question is being posed ma salaka kum fis saqar what has driven you into the pits of hell and the response is lam naku min al musallin We were not those who established the prayer. Now what that prayer does not mean the Allahu Akbar and Ruku and Sujood. It just generally meant we did not establish the prayer, signifying that we were not connected with the loftier realm. We were not humbled before a lofty authority. We took authority upon ourselves. وَلَمْ نَكُونُ تَعَمُوا الْمِسْكِينَ And we were not mindful of the poor. We were not feeding them. وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِذِينَ And we used to engage in vain discourse and vain talk. So these were the reasons God was giving on behalf of the Jahiliyyah for them falling within hell. These were the first surahs that were coming in. Then after that, as we explained yesterday, when the Prophet began to open up to this experience of revelation and began to share within his small circles, and we will see tomorrow, that at this point he was no threat to the Meccans at all. He was no threat to their status quo. He was not saying anything else. He was just preaching what he was receiving. But here this phenomenal sentiment started coming of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, the sustainer. Now you can imagine that the Meccans already had that sort of a notion that Allah is the creator, is the sustainer, albeit removed from existence right now. But initially he was. So they did not find these things strange. And then again, God started saying that Allah forgives all sins. Do not despair from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although I know this is a later verse, but this sentiment is being expressed. Now what is happening here in the minds of the young and inquisitive They are seeing that this is now a new hope for us. So they were saying, if we actually come to this path, we have a fresh start. Now you can see how impactful that is psychologically. You say to somebody that, look, whatever you may have done prior to this day, come upon this path and you make a clean start. Your slate is wiped clean. This is what we need from time to time, even in our daily lives that your slate is being cleaned. Make a fresh start. 
This was something that was truly appealing to these people. But the problem started, and that's not what we are going to talk about today, but the problem started. And it was a problem in one sense, and won many adherents on the other hand, was God declaring all human beings equal in his sight. Now, this was an affront to the Jahiliya system, because the Jahiliya system believed in classes, people destined to be at the top of the state, uh, social uh, tree, uh, sorry, the, the um, hierarchy, on the top of the societal hierarchy, and those destined to be at the bottom. Slaves, are they even worthy humans? Are women even people who have any rights? These were the sentiments of Jahiliya. Now, when God says that all are equal before him, when women and men were made equal, people like Hind were overjoyed, even though she did not believe in the message, she did not like it, she acknowledged that these are wonderful words, and she smiled and laughed. And she was a very feisty woman, and a very secure woman in her own personality. But when the verse came, that the slave and free men are equal before God. There is no distinction. Now here it is, when you are starting to challenge the status quo. But at the same time, the amount of followers that the Prophet was finding, the slaves were turning into Muslims. The young people were being attracted by the intellectual message there, the new lease of life. The women were coming into Islam by thinking that we are getting here equal status before God, the unreachable God. The poor were flocking towards Islam because here is a recognition of our equal identity and this messenger is preaching our rights upon the society. Now the impact was so phenomenal that you find a huge rock placed upon the chest of a slave and he was being told and whipped in the heat of the day to pronounce the name of the goddesses, Latin Uzza. And he was saying, La ilaha illallah. Now you've seen that scene in movies, and you've read about it, and you've heard it, but can you imagine the amount of faith that has to prevail within a chest? For that chest to break under the weight of a rock, and he is still not budging, until Abu Bakr, Khalifa Abu Bakr, who became Khalifa later on, came and spent the money and freed, freed Bilal in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on the one hand, Abu Bakr, his love for the faith was such that he came with his money and he freed another creature of God. On the other hand, Bilal under the weight of the rock. These are faith on both sides. This is the extent to which these people are moved. On the other hand, you find a woman. So may I believe, who was being told, believe in Latin Uzza. And she is so now involved in Allah. That she's saying, la ilaha illallah, and she's speared. Now that creates an impact on the minds of all the onlookers. There is a slave who has acquired such audacity that he goes against the will of his master. What empowers him to this extent? There is a woman who is unworthy of mention by their standards, of course. Who is unworthy of mention, has no social or societal status. She has taken it upon herself to conclude that there is no God but God and I am going to give myself over to him even if I am put to death. Now imagine the sort of impact that creates upon the minds of those around them searching, feeling defeated, feeling lost for direction, feeling cheated by the societal system, by the hierarchy and of course the anarchy. And imagine the challenge that posed within the minds of the warlords of Mecca, the people who control the business in Mecca. And of course, when people would come to Mecca for pilgrimage, they would hear these stories, and go away and talk about it. Everything was happening organically. You see, when you study the Prophet, he really did have a tough ride. You know, we feel that Mecca was very difficult, as we will explain tomorrow. Today I want to go into something else. Makkah was difficult and he fled to Medina and Medina was fine. It's not the case. Medina was the most difficult part and the most challenging part of the Prophet's life. 
His life was fraught with difficulties upon difficulties. But the thing is, it's an amazing thing, insightful, that through those difficulties, God was carving out his destiny, and the destiny of Islam and the spreading of the message. And I have noticed this. When we embark upon an enterprise or on a venture, and if we get early success, that thing doesn't grow. It just doesn't grow. I've noticed this. I'm talking about not iPhone and things like that. You will just point out to me and you say, well, they grew exponentially. I'm talking about intellectual establishments, a new thought. There is always a lot of struggle. But in those struggles, what is happening is that a lot of pieces of the puzzle everywhere are falling together bit by bit by bit. By slow, steady successes, challenges, defeats, and success, the word is spreading. More and more people are becoming accustomed to the new thing, listening to a new idea, and they're flocking in gradually. It's a very organic process. That was what was happening at the time of the blessed prophet, and you can see this. Now, if we can just talk today then, before going on to the Meccan side tomorrow, of the general strategy of the Quran, the Quran could only be successful if it was mindful of human nature. You see, look, the Quran says to the Prophet, it is no good you having this wishful thinking and thought that everybody be converted. God has not destined that to happen. Finish. Period. O Muhammad, لَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهَ لَهَدَى لَأَتَى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ هُدَاهَا Had Allah wanted whoever is talking with the Prophet at this point, Ruhu Lameen or Ruhu Quds, saying to the Prophet, that had Allah wanted, he would have given every soul its guidance. Allah does not want to do that. Finish. The real story is that you preach. You preach and gradually let them come of age, be refined. It was a very real process. God did not want people to be guided through means beyond their own striving and ability. You see, you can take a person to the theater and then tweak their brains and make them feel that they are saints. That, and chemicals, God did not want to do that. God wanted a very real process to ensue and to take place. So the prophet was told from the very beginning, the process is going to be an arduous, difficult process. We find this, I, I read it in the exegesis somewhere, I don't know which exegesis, it was years ago, that prophet stood on Safa. And the Quraysh came to him, they said, Muhammad, there is a way in which we will all pay heed to your message and we will listen to you. He said, how? They said, convert the Mount Safa into gold. The prophet was delighted. He was delighted. So he prayed. Jibreel came, he said, Muhammad, surely God can do that. But God is sending you a message with it. That if he were to convert the mountain Safa into gold, and if after that they reject belief, God will punish him in a way he hasn't punished anybody else. Do you want to take the risk? The Prophet said no. Because the Prophet was reminded that Isa alayhi, had asked Allah on the behest and request of the Israelites, O Lord, anzil alayna ma'idatan minas sama. O Lord, cause there to descend upon us a banquet from the heavens. Yakun aidan lana. Let it be a feast for us. The response Allah gives to Isa is, I will do it. But if after that they disbelieve, I will punish them in a way I have not punished anybody else. And then, of course, subsequently, when we read the verses elsewhere in exegy, they were turned into pigs and apes. So the Prophet said, No, I would not take the risk. So, therefore, the process now that begins is a natural process an organic process. Now this process is described in a later surah. <laughs> he sends amongst the ummi a messenger who is amongst them, from amongst them. <laughs> now there is a sequence given who recites upon them his signs, then purifies them you can see there was a whole process. Recitation of signs, purification. After the purification comes the teaching of the book and the teaching of wisdom. And we will discuss, you cannot teach wisdom. You can just describe wisdom. 
Wisdom has to be acquired. We'll go into that in a little while. It was a very natural process that had to take place. Now, how was that happening? If the Prophet were to have come and spoken in his own language, they would not have listened to him because they would have said, well, it's nothing special. Some jinni is inspiring you. They had these superstitions. Or it's your wishful thinking, oh, you must have heard some Christian priest talking with you and you're just repeating and we've not been appealed by these messages at all. So the eloquence of the Quran was outstanding. So when the Prophet recited the signs, he did not speak out the signs and explain to them and express to them in his own speech. He did not articulate his understanding. He merely became a mouthpiece for the revelation and he spoke out what was coming to him. Now on the one hand, they faced this eloquence of the Quran, rhythmic sounds, the soothing, calming effect, meditative prose that put you into deep trance. And they, was, they were dumbfounded. They were saying, what is this? Abu Sufyan says to him at one point, but truly, where is it coming from? He has never spoken like this and nobody else has spoken like this. So the eloquence of the Quran was such that they could not but take notice of it. The mere sounds of the Quran. Now when they were drawn to the words of the Quran, these mesmerizing words, just the sounds of it, the way it was structured and formulated and phrased, verses into surahs and joining with one another and the beautiful ending, Ahad, Samad, Yalid, Yulad, Lam Yakun Lahu Kufuan, Ahad. Can you see that? Ending with Da, 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 Da. Tabbat Yada Bi Lahabim Wa Tab. Ma'agna Anhu Ma'aluhu Wa Ma'aka Sab. Can you see this? That's the Sukoon at the end. Those people were put into a state of wonder. What is this language? That drew them in to listening to the content. Now, although this is from Surah Hajj, but this is a sampler from the sort of verses that were coming in. And others were uh, in, from Makkah that I will recite. But now listen to this. If a person is steeped in materialism, arrogance, neglect of others, neglect of any notion of life beyond this, and still there's an inner prodding deep within them at an intuitive level. A person like that is confronted with a verse like this. Think about this. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Yawma tarawnaha tadhalu kullu murda'atin amma arda'at. On the day in which you see it, every wet nursing mother shall become mindless of her baby. وَتَضَعُ كُلُّ ذَاتِ حَمْلٍ حَمْلَهَا And every pregnant woman will miscarry her child. وَتَرَى النَّاسَ سُكَارَ وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارَ And you will see people, they will appear drunker to you. They will not be drunk. Nay, وَلَكِنَّ أَضَابَ اللَّهِ شَدِيدٍ the chastisement of Allah will be so intense and severe. Now imagine, with that eloquence, you are delivered this meaning. It is bound to shock you. Then another verse. وَمَنْ يَهْدِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ الْمُهْتَدِ And the one who Allah guides, he is indeed guided aright. وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُمْ أَوْلِيَا مِنْ دُونِي And the one who he wishes to misguide, then you shall find no one other than Allah who will guide them. Into this. And we shall raise them on the day of Qiyamah upon their faces. Deaf, dumb, and blind. Their resting place shall be hell. Every time the flames shall subside a little, we will increase them in the flame and in the scorching fire. So when people were hearing this, it was actually terrifying them. It was shocking them to the core. Look at this verse. When the heaven is torn apart. And when the stars are scattered. And when the seas explode. And when the graves are opened up. 
every soul will immediately realize what I have sent forth and what I have failed out in my opportunity. Now you can imagine, even today, if somebody was paying attention to these verses, it will shake them to the core. It will take away our worry about who's saying what about me, or this money that I have lost in this transaction. We would not be concerned in the least. These verses were shocking them. On the one hand, the eloquence of the Quran that could not be denied. On the other hand, the depth of the meaning. And then the Quran's ability to tap into their psychology, because it was a progressive message, very organically done, go from their psychology to their intellect to their spirit. A very beautifully constructed message over 23 years, from individual to community to state to empire, whatever. It was a very progressive trend. The first thing was strike at that depth where they are entertaining some doubt about their worldview and their existence and notion of life. Strike there where they feel that there is something more to it than what we have understood. Now the Quran spoke at that level and these verses struck like arrows upon their targets. These people were shocked, awed, trembling. This process is then the process of cleansing. They are being cleansed of their arrogance. You see, before this process takes place, you try and reason with somebody. It's going to be very, very difficult because they will have thousands of counter arguments. They have hearts through which they reflect not. You say to people, it's so obvious, can you not understand? They will say, no, our forefathers and fathers, they all can't be wrong. Even if it's not a rational argument, but it's an argument that they will give because they just do not feel empowered enough to think. However, when the cleansing process comes, what happens is that the status quo in the mind and the heart and all these big towers and idols, everything gets crushed. Once everything gets crushed, then what happens? The souls become very, very receptive. So the first thing you need to do is to break that. That's what Abraham did. I mean, would you say what he did was right by today's standard? Go and break their gods? No, let them worship their gods. Why are you breaking them all, right? But God honors him. He wasn't a messenger at that point. He was just an angry young man. He might be saying, why is he calling Abraham an angry young man? He was. He was angry and frustrated. He said, how have they cheated me by worshipping these stones and statues? This is what most reformers feel. You know why they come out angry, these little young reformers? It's not their fault. When they awaken, they see that we have been cheated from the message of God by all these hierarchies and this Islam and this Shia and this Sunni and these ceremonies. I have been cheated of a whole life. And that's why when they read, they awaken, they feel this sense of anger. And that's why you see them coming out so forcefully. Understand their psychology, it's not their fault. They are just acting out what their human dictates dictate to them. In any case, once this cleansing process is done, they become receptive. Now when they became receptive, the Quran was amazing the way it did things. It prompted its audience to start reflecting and thinking. Look, now you've moved away from your previous positions. You've become neutralized. Now start building afresh. Now this was possibly revealed in Makkah. Look at the beautiful words. Afala yanduruna ilal ibili keifa khuliqat. Do they not consider the animal? Do they not consider the camel? How it has been created. Now think about this. We live amongst the camel, don't we? We take it for granted. We are born. We've always seen a camel in front of us. Now, when you are asked with that beautiful eloquence of the Quran, do they not consider the camel, how it has been created? You will be prompted into thinking. Hold on. This is a desert environment. No animal can survive here. Human beings cannot survive here. 
without carrying their provisions, and they too would have to then make frequent stops at oases to get water. The only animal that can survive under the Enviro harsh environment of the sun and the desert and the sand storms and the sand dune is a camel. Look at how well its feet are adapted. The humps that it has to carry water, the thick eyelids it has, the long neck and the head that it turns and sees over the sandstorms. This verse in itself is so striking, just one verse to say, yes. Something is going on here. There is a greater truth. I need to awaken to it. So after the cleansing process comes the process of igniting their thought processes. Making them think. Allah says, look at the broader cosmos. <laughs> the sky, how it has been raised. Do they not see how perfectly everything is created? The mountains are pegged deep in the earth. The earth is made flattened. Of course, these are futuristic verses. They were not meant for the Arabs, but for their consumption, they also work to their limited knowledge. But there is something far more in these verses. But in any case, the Quran says, Do you not see the stars? Thereby you are guided. It's been set there for you to be guided. Do you not see the mass of water and the wood and how the ark sails upon it? Do you not see the friendly winds that carry you from one place to another? They were prompted into thinking that, wait a minute, I have never been mindful of this reality that is about. There is a universe that has been designed by hand by somebody. This was their thinking. How can everything be so meticulously done? And on top of that, the audacity of the Qur'an. Why do you worship the sun and the moon and the stars? They have been made subservient to you. The sun cannot stop shining, even if it wanted to. It is put there for you. You are loftier than it. Amazing, isn't it? To liberate people to that level. The stars have been placed for you, for you to be guided aright in the depths of the ocean. So this process deepens. Then the Quran gives intellectual challenges. Now this was the most dangerous part for the Meccans. The intellectual challenge. The Quran effectively broke all red line. He said there is no red line. <laughs> so the first thing the Quran says is, لَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عَنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجِدُ فِي اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا If this Quran in itself was from other than Allah, you would find a lot of discrepancies in there. Go and challenge me and find discrepancies. The same standards. You can see what's happening to the minds of the people. Hold on. This Quran is not only challenging the pagan Qureshi Meccan status quo. It is asking us to challenge itself as well. If you be in any doubt, produce 10 surahs like this. Produce one surah like this. Produce anything like this. Go on. It was saying, challenging the Qur'an itself is not a red line. Leave aside anything else. Now this was the most dangerous part of it all. You see, the Arabs had everybody under control through their ceremonies, through their exploitive ways, through their devotion to their gods. Now you're getting groups of people who are saying, why? It doesn't make sense. The rational inquiry. You see, today's Molanas are really frustrated at the community awakening. Because the community is saying, why? Why should I do this? What point is there in me doing this? And the Molanas are saying, wow, how can you even ask such a question? The Mujtahid has said it. So what if the Mujtahid said, he studied 70 years? Well, you can be, he would have studied a thousand years, but this thing doesn't make sense. Can you see how offensive it is even today? If today somebody says the Mujtahid is saying something that is not according with reason, it's offensive, isn't it? It was the same offense felt by the Meccans. Our gods are saying this, while your gods are still talking nonsense. I had to get that word out of my system. We've been waiting for years to get it out. Salawat. I put a self-imposed ban on that word nonsense 10 years ago. I still got banned. So <laughs> it's, it's back in the lingo now. So there were no red lines. 
if the red line see today when we say why are we doing all the things that we are doing they are in mafatiul jinan well so what if they're in mafatiul jinan do they make sense but Sheikh Abbas Qumi has narrated so what if Sheikh Abbas Qumi has narrated it there's a big chain to it so what if there's a big chain to it if this thing were to be given to me if I was not a Muslim I would never be appealed to such an Islam does that make sense if a dua that is in Mafatiul Jinan cursing everybody left right and center and causing bloodshed if I wasn't a Muslim I would have said what sort of an Imam teaches people to do this and cause bloodshed I would have never embraced such an Islam, but it's only because I know the Imams have never done this thing. And they are the best people in their morality and in their virtues. But if I was not a Muslim and did not belong to this persuasion, by reading Mafatiul Jinnah, I'd be totally put off. I'll say even these guys don't know what they're talking about, their Imams are the same as them. Can you see that? That is offensive to the Muslim audience. It's offensive. It was offensive to the Meccans. But the people were empowered. Now, when you empower a people, they will not stop. And I know the trend can go in a very big tangent in a wrong way, but that's the risk we bear. That's how humanity is. So they began to ask questions. Well, this doesn't make sense. Why should we bury daughters? For what? Why should we sacrifice children? For what? Is God so incapable of providing us food? Why should only the women eat this and men eat this and boys eat this and girls eat this? They made haram and halal and all these laws. These people were so empowered. They were questioning. And in their questioning, they were destroying the status quo. Now, of course, some of their questioning may not have been justified. I know that. Some of the pagan traditions might have been good. Some rituals might have been good. Because think about it carefully. The Prophet retained a lot of the societal regulations and laws of the Jahiliya. He just tweaked them up, didn't he? We know this through our studies. But these young people, they were empowered. And young people are young people. They are aggressive. This is now something that was causing a stir. We will discuss tomorrow more about it within the Meccans. That these guys know no red line, no boundary. There is no sacredness left anymore. But the appeal was great. The appeal is great. That the people felt suffocated within the status quo and within the religion. You can't ask this question. You can't go against this tradition. Here are people saying, why not? If it is so right, explain it to me. That empowered state did not fail to impact many others. And the Prophet was gathering support of not only the old, weak, poor, downtrodden orphans. He was now gaining support of thinkers, of young people, of people who were now becoming a formidable challenge. Tomorrow we'll go into it more. In this process, God was introduced as a force of liberation. Who is empowering you? God. Who is giving you the courage to ask? Allah. Who is giving you the courage to question without any blame? Who honors your right to question? Who is in sync with your nature? Who speaks at your intuitive level? Who reasons with you? Who gives you that respect to reason with you and not impose upon you? God does. Can you see that? Today's religion is failing because there is no rationality about it. But at that time, God was seen as the one who reasons with them. They felt empowered. So God was introduced as the one supplying all of these beauties. Now, when God was introduced, the Quran is extremely in sync with nature, human nature, human psychology, the way human beings are. The prayers were given to them in a very loose way. These five prayers and everything happens in Medina. Of course, they happen in, in Makkah towards the end. They start taking form, but proper times and everything comes in Medina. You're just this is at night just stand and pray to rakat just pray to rakat minimalistic remember allah read the quran that was the only devotion required then purify yourself inner purification remove your greed remove the indecency in your heart remove vanity from you remove filth from your tongues remove these things 
and outer purity. Give to the other, care for the other. People were feeling liberated. <coughs> God did not introduce burdensome prayers or rituals. Remember Allah, chant His name, think through things, observe nature. And you can find this, uh, this verse in Surah Al Imran, which was obviously revealed in Medina, but that was a sentiment. People who remember Allah standing, sitting on their sides, and they reflect into the nature of the existence of the heavens and the earth. These were the processes that were being brought about. When this particular part was over, I'm saying everything happened simultaneously, but I'm just trying to point out how this sequentially, if we want to think about it, then the teaching of the book comes. Now the teaching of the book are two types. They are either factual or moral teachings. The factual is, well, this is what Adam was. This is your origin. This is the genesis. This is how you are created. This is how you got here. This was Iblis. Iblis is your enemy. These are the jinns. These are the angels. These are the past prophets. Their messages were the same as the messages given to you. It's from one source. They face the same difficulties that you are facing, O Muhammad. Their followers face the same difficulties as your followers are facing their difficulties. So they were getting educated. It is not all about being pious and questioning, but at the same time, the Quran is supplying that fundamental need of education. So it's educating them, healing them, nurturing them intellectually. So a lot of information is given, been given and imparted. And of course, you can imagine for the first time when a student begins to learn and get educated, you can imagine how they feel. I know this now. You know why we, 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 we don't uh, remember those days now? Because we are constantly in books. But if a person who has left their books picks up a book and starts reading, they will feel that elated state within and a joy that they've never encountered previously. That's what knowledge does. The other level of knowledge was the moral knowledge. The need for a just community where rights are given properly. Care, as I said, for others, altruistic sentiments instilled. But together with that, Obedience of parent, care for the parent, for the kin, do not break ties with them. And even if they break ties, you mend them. If somebody asks something, give it to them for the sake of Allah. Being true to the promises, transacting properly, giving in proper measures, receiving in proper measures. Now we might think these are ordinary teachings, but they are not ordinary teachings. Even today, you know, one of the biggest sickness that we have is that people do not honor their promises. You can't trust anybody. The one thing the parents are suffering from is the disobedience of their children and lack of respect. This is a real problem today as well. So when you, can, when you find the, the group of people following the prophet, respecting their parents, their parents were moved and brought to the faith as well. One of the other things that is a sickness of our society is breaking ties with our kin. Brothers fighting brothers and holding vendettas. The Quran did away with all. We need this right now, to be honest with you. When I think about this, maybe we need the whole process taking place today. In any case, the final part is wisdom. You al kitaba wal hikmah, and he teaches them wisdom. Now, wisdom cannot be taught. Wisdom is an acquired state. It's the disposition of the soul, a state of mind, with that penetrative insight into the consequences of actions, accompanied with the gentleness, humility, and mellowness of the soul. That is what wisdom is. So look at the verses of wisdom. يُتِلْ حِكْمَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُعْتِلْ حِكْمَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا he gives wisdom to whoever he wants. And whoever has been granted wisdom 
has been given a great deal of good. You know, when you say this moral philosophers, like when we, 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 we philosophize and talk about, it's not, it's not coming from a wise place. It's a wise statement. But a wise person is somebody else. You can have a wise statement, but a, but a wise state is something else. And look at this verse. وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ And we gave Luqman hikmah, wisdom. And what was hikmah? This, anishkur lillah. He says to his son, be thankful to God. وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِ And whoever is thankful, he is thankful for his own self. وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِي Hamid. And he who denies, then Allah is needless. So wisdom that God is talking about is the end of the process. I want to read the verses on wisdom before I finish today. But think about what the prophetic message was. Read the signs, awaken them. When you've made them receptive, ignite their minds into thinking. When they are ignited, educate them. Teach them of the book. When they are educated, then refine their characters. When they are refined, they ought to naturally come to a state of wisdom. And that seems to be the end of the human journey. That seems to be the time of Qiyamah. That humanity has to arrive at that state that is befitting it of wisdom. Once they are there, maybe we've done our time on earth. Whether Allah takes us or spreads us within the skies as his Khalifa, Allah knows best. Maybe the Khilafah of Adam initiated here for us to qualify and go to the different parts of God's world, who knows? I'm speculating. In Surah Bani Israel, you find these verses. I'm not going to read all of them. So these verses say, and do not go near the orphan's property except with the best intention until he has reached his maturity and honor your pledge because the pledge involves responsibility. And give full measure when you measure and weigh with accurate scales. That is fair and the best determination. Now look at this. And do not occupy yourself with what you have no knowledge of. For indeed, the hearing, the sight, and the mind will all be brought to question. Now that is a state of wisdom. All these will be questioned. And do not walk proudly upon the earth. You can neither pierce the earth, nor can you match the mountains in height. The evil of all of these is disliked by your Lord. That is some of the wisdom your Lord has revealed to you. So when you see these verses, do not walk haughtily. Do not raise your voice, for indeed, the worst of voice is the braying of a donkey. Of course, for the donkey it's right. But for a human being to act like a donkey, it's the worst of the things that he can do. You know, I had to qualify that because the animal rights protesters got on my back last time round. I said, the worst voice is the brain of a donkey. They said, how dare you criticize the brain of a donkey? But for a human being, it is not worthy. Walking haughtily, talking about things that we know not of. These are the things that are inconsistent with the state of wisdom. So wisdom is an insightful state. State of knowing the consequences. State of knowing our humble state before God. And that we are evolving to God. A state of beautiful inner surrender, gentleness and humility. And that seems to be the end product. But I do believe that the blessed prophet did arrive at that point with great many of his blessed sahaba. We come to that sort of a person tonight. The person of Hor ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. It's the night of Ashura, a man filled with insight and wisdom. Hor fears for the worst. He approaches Umar ibn Sa'ad, hoping against hope that a battle shall not ensue. He says, Umar, shall we indeed engage in a battle with these people? In no time shall their heads be severed from their bodies and their arms cut from their shoulders. O oh, Hor, fear not. It will be but an hour or two. Who heard this? At a distance, 
he hears the voice of Hussein. Is there a helper who shall come to our aid? Is there one who shall defend the honor of the household of the Prophet of God? He moved away from the company of Umar ibn Sa'd. A person was with him, accompanying him. He said, have you watered your horse? He said, no. He said, go and give water to your animal. Hur was slowly advancing towards the battlefield. Muhajir looks at Hur. He said, Hur, do you wish to preempt a strike? Hur trembled. Muhajir said, Hur, had I been asked, who is the bravest amongst us? I would say, by God, it is Hur, the son of Yazid al-Riyahi. And you tremble so like a leaf. He said, I see myself between heaven and hell. By God, I shall not prefer anything over heaven, even if I am cut into pieces and then burnt. Hur makes his way towards the camp of Hussein. His brother and son join him. He comes to Hussein. He says, oh Hussein, do you have forgiveness in your heart for me? I come penitent, apologetic, regretful. I did not feel these godless people will bring the affair to this state. Who said, God has forgiven you? Hussein said, God has forgiven you, Hor. Dear brother, I have forgiven you. Descend from your steed and embrace me. Who said, Hussein, allow me to remain mounted. Give me permission to address the daughters of the Prophet. He goes outside the camp and he says, O oh, daughters of Muhammad and Khadija, O oh, daughters of Fatima, there comes before you a man guilty of bringing you into this wilderness and bringing you, a point, bringing you to a point where Hussein faces a certain death. Do you have it in your hearts to seek forgiveness from me, for me, and forgive me? Will you find it in your hearts to not complain against me on the day of Qiyamah? As they heard his pleas, they began to cry. And the skies filled with their crying and wailing. Who descended from his steed and began to beat his face. And he said, if only my hands were to have become paralyzed. If only my tongue were to have been severed from my mouth before I spoke to Hussein in the audacious way in which I spoke. Some of the women came out and they consoled Hor and they said, Oh Hor, may Allah be with you. Hor comes to Hussein, allow me, O oh Hussein, to fight for you, whose brother and son go. Bukair is the son of Hor. He fights gallantly, comes back to Hor. He says, Oh Father, is there water by which I can quench my thirst? Persevere a while longer, O oh child, for his grandfather shall quench your thirst with the goblets of Gother. As Bukhair already falls, Hor proudly advances towards his son. Did you see how he fought? He does not cry, does not break, comes to the body of his son. May Allah reward you on behalf of your old father, O oh child. Who seeks permission? Fights a gallant battle. His horse is lame. He cries out, May Allah not quench your thirst, O oh enemies of God. There comes to you a guest and you keep him thirsty. You invite him and now you put him to death. They attack him. Who falls? As he falls, he cries out, Peace be with you, O oh, Abba Abdullah. Abba Abdullah rushes and hastens to him with Habib ibn Madahir. Abba Abdullah lifts the head of Hur into his lap and begins to cleanse his forehead and face of wound and dust. Hur opens his eyes and breaks into a smile. Habib says, O oh, Hur, do you see his grandfather, the messenger, coming to you? Who said, Habib, I see no such thing. Oh, whore, then why do you smile? 
He said, Habib, because I find my head in his lap. Matam Hussein.